to you this being wednesday the week of a teresa corley unsolved homicide and since it's wednesday it's a deep dive so you already looked at monday the overview of the case you know that i was retained by the family to look at this back in 2016 you also know that i wrote a chapter of it about the case in my book unsolved no more with my assessment and you looked at Tuesday's key clue, which was the quaalude and eggs. So today we're going to dive a little deeper into like the timeline, the suspects, and if my mind has changed over the past five years. You know, in five years, I've, I've learned a lot and I've worked with uh, a lot more cases and maybe something has changed, but maybe not. So... The first thing that we want to look at in Teresa Corley is her victimology. And I talked a little bit about this earlier in the week. She, she was a fighter. And that is, she was presented in a light where, or a situation where it was fight or flight, she would fight. <clears throat> That's key. Now... I rarely have a case where there are so many suspects for a low-risk victim. You know, a low-risk victim is, you know, maybe a child that's brought up in a healthy environment, in a good neighborhood, uh, with caring parents. That's a, a low-risk victim. Or maybe a nun. Uh, a high-risk victim being a prostitute or a drug user who are always in a, a level of a higher risk of being a victim. Teresa doesn't seem like that at all. And by all accounts, she was safe. She, she wasn't a high risk victim at all. So why did she become a victim? That's what we have to look at. So through her victimology, she was raised in a... <clears throat> in a tough environment with siblings um, that were older than her, but she integrated well into whatever community she was in. Um, she was not easily intimidated. I'm reading here uh, from a quote from the victimology form that I had them, the family fill out. Uh, she wasn't fearful of falling victim to any type of violent crime. Teresa's family once lived in a predominantly African-American community in the Boston area and then moved to Bellingham. Um, she had a false sense of security because of this. But Bellingham is a small royal town as compared to the area in Boston where they used to live. Uh, Teresa's professional goal was to be a pediatrician. Um, she was enrolled at classes at Holliston Junior College to become a medical assistant. And she had only lived in Bellingham a couple years prior to her death. So when I look at this victimology form, okay, first off, why, why have somebody fill out that form? Again, you want to know that victim. And I gave many examples of this, so I don't want to rehash it. But it gives you an insight as to what they will do during a given situation. 
it also tells you you can start deducing things maybe not a hundred percent but you know you can you can certainly deduce from possibility to probabilities based strictly on victimology now here's an example in this case so I'm gonna read right from my report you know what I deduced straight from victimology so this is my victimology assessment so what about Teresa's victimology help us us get closer to solving her murder we can deduce a number of things just from victimology okay so number one she would speak to strangers which leads to her vulnerability to be coaxed into a vehicle of possible abduction okay she was trusting we can deduce this because of her outgoing nature and the fact she hitchhiked often she was tough she believed nothing bad would happen to her especially as it related to her walking and hitchhiking she was not a heavy drinker she did smoke marijuana but that was the extent of her drug use and it wasn't extensive her small body weight and height 5'4 120 would have an effect on her intoxication level when drinking see these things you learn from victimology as well and they play a key role in deducing what happened number five her sexual history indicates only two known partners if this is true the account of consensual sex that we're going to encounter later at the presidential arms with multiple partners can be called into question she was attractive in good physical shape and she walked a lot she may have been a victim of a past sexual assault by a neighbor that's not confirmed and she had a good if not great relationship with her family and her mother and would call home if in trouble now that's that's eight items that we deduced just from her victimology alone do you see how this now can play into the unfolding of this case as we go forward so from that victimology let's jump right to the timeline let's jump to and I want to be specific on this timeline like I told you that I would be so on December 4th 1978 between 3 p.m. and 7 p.m. Teresa goes to work and she works at a place called penthouse sales I talked about that earlier in the week she says that she's going to a party later nothing unusual you know she's in college she's 19 you know okay Now, at some point before going to the bar, she is drinking at a person's house whose name's Jimmy at his apartment. So her intoxication level is starting to, to go. At 10.30, so between 7 and 10.30, within that time frame, she's already drinking. At 10.30, she arrives at the train stop bar. She's there to celebrate a friend's birthday. This was planned. She's there for an hour till about 11.30. Her boyfriend is there with her. her. His name is Rick. They get into an argument. Now, what is that argument about? Um, he is seen talking to one of his ex-girlfriends there, supposedly, and there were some jealousy issues there. You know, just like any typical young relationship nothing out of the ordinary but she leaves that bar now this is where some discrepancy comes in and this is where it hurts not having the police reports because I think the police reports would have this fact that we should know so we don't know whether she hitchhikes or she's or she's given a ride I tend to believe she's given a ride um, to the Academy Arms apartment building there's documentation that she's picked up by a gentleman named Ronnie his name is going to be important in this so remember Ronnie his brother or a relation I believe it's a brother Donnie a gentleman possibly named Michael and another individual so you might have three or four individuals in this car that pick her up she knows at least one of the people in the car or she, more than likely she wouldn't have got in 
But her victimology says maybe she would because she hitchhiked. But she's, she's intoxicated at this point. By all, I, I can't say that because I have, no, I have no documentation, no statements of that at this point. I'm just going by since she's been drinking since 7 o'clock, 7.30, and now it's 11.30. And she wasn't a heavy drinker. She's picked up in front of the Dairy Queen that's located at 21 North Main Street. Okay? That's going to be important too. Regardless of how she gets there, she gets to this party. She's told there's a party at this Presidential Arms apartment building. She is there from let's let's just say 11:45 p.m. to 4 in the morning big gap of time right between 4 and 4:30 she leaves the apartment building now there is a discrepancy as to why she leaves it is suggested that she is angry that a possible sexual assault or a sexual assault attempt is occurring or had occurred but we don't we don't know for sure but what we do know is when she departs she leaves that apartment with mismatched shoes one male shoe and one of her own shoe now see this is something that had to be worked backwards from when the body is discovered it's not that simple the body's discovered and if you find two different types of shoes, well, you're thinking, well, what's going on? Well, they worked it backwards, and this is where it came from, that apartment building. Now, why? Well, I surmised at the time that it could be, and probably is because of her intoxication level, her haste to leave if she was in a hurry running to get out of there, or simply because it was dark. Or a combination of all three, which it probably was. But it's approximately a four-hour window there. That's a long time to be a, at a party that you don't want to be at, right? So between four and five, now that she has left that apartment building, that party, where it was all guys... She's observed sitting on a guardrail between 4 and 5 a.m. on Route 140, and she's picked up by a Garlic Farms truck driver. He drives her to the entrance of his employer, which is at 1199 West Central Street in Franklin, Massachusetts. He drops her off there. She's then picked up by a second Garlic Farms driver who drops her off in front of the police station at the intersection of Route 140 and Route 126. They say she's cold. They say she's intoxicated. That's 5 o'clock. She's dropped off in front of the police station. She makes no mention of reporting a sexual assault to the police or anything, but this is where they drop her off. Now, why there? Why it w were... Because she only lived another half mile up. So why did they take her there? Is it because the truck driver was not going another half mile? Was that out of his way? That's something that I think I would want to know. And I don't think I ever got an answer to that. But at 5.30 a.m., 30 minutes now, probably after she was dropped off, Teresa is observed by three men carpooling to work at the General Motors plant. She's walking past the Dairy Queen, same Dairy Queen that she was picked up in front of walking towards Hartford Avenue this is the last known sighting of Teresa alive this is on December 5th December 8th three days later at 4 30 p.m. a call is placed to the police station about a body being located the caller identified himself as John Burlington from Connecticut Police get there. Teresa's body is recovered in a gully off of the northbound lane of Interstate 495. Okay, this John Burlington is going to be a key figure 
as well as we move forward here. So now let's talk about the body location. Everybody knows who knows me and watches this channel um, and watched me on the History Channel as well because this was a big deal for me on the History Channel was to always go to a crime scene location. For me, it's paramount. Yet, in this case, there is none. But there is a body dump location. So, it could be a crime scene location, sure. But it appears that it's a body dump location because it's off a major interstate, 495. Now, I didn't have a lot to go on when I first looked at this case, but let me, I'll, just, I'll just read some of the thoughts that I had there. We can tell a lot by this location where Teresa's body was recovered. The location is along the northbound lane of Interstate 495, which is a busy major road, and I already said that. The exact location was approximately 25 to 35 feet down an embankment in a small gully. It appears that she wasn't dumped out of the vehicle. She was dragged or carried to that final resting spot. So what, what can we tell about that location? I'm trying to think of how I want to frame this, this thought of how why does somebody, I'll frame it as a, a question to you guys. Why does somebody dump a body off a major interstate? I mean, that's a pretty easy answer, right? It's in a vehicle. We all agree on that. Heading out of town. That would be an assumption that would probably fit the area, fit this crime. She is found naked. Some of her clothes are found thrown next to her, but not all of the clothing was found. The manner of death is obviously homicide. At autopsy, it is found that she was strangled, but she was strangled by a ligature. Now, ligature strangulation is not the most common form in ways to kill somebody. It Sure, I mean, it certainly happens a lot, but it's not... Unless it's used by an organized offender, by somebody who brings their own weapons, their own rape kit, or it is a weapon of opportunity. And we'll get into that a little bit further when I deduce what I thought happened here. But let's, let's jump now to why. Why a person dies. Why did Teresa die? To me, there are only two scenarios as to why Teresa died that night. One, obviously, because of an incident that took place at the Academy. I keep saying Academy because I'm thinking of Don Miller. Presidential Arms Apartment Building. Something that occurred there. resulted later, a couple hours later, in her death. Or, the hitchhiking slash walking home. That's it. But both of those scenarios have to be, have to be drawn out and looked into. So, Teresa told the second truck driver, who dropped her off at the police station, that she was sexually assaulted. And I'm going to read what he said. 
he stated that he dropped her off in front of the police station. If she was sexually assaulted while at the Presidential Arms apartment building, there is a possibility the offender, offenders or offender wanted to silence her from reporting the crime. So if she told this truck driver that she was sexually assaulted, that could clear up the reason why she was dropped off right in front of the police station. Right? And not her house. So why didn't she go in to report that she was sexually assaulted? Could be a, a, a number of reasons. Could be one, maybe she was embarrassed. Maybe two, she thought she'd get in trouble because she was intoxicated. I mean, she would get in trouble for underage drinking. Three, maybe she had some self-doubt as to whether it was a sexual assault or if it was consensual. But again, we go back to her victimology. Two known sexual partners. I have a hard time believing that all of a sudden she's going to have sex with multiple people at this apartment. I don't care what her intoxication level is. But she's there for four hours and I can't get over that fact. Could she have been held against her will? Sure. Maybe not physically. But again, she she went to this party where she maybe known one person. And now, how's she getting home? You know, it's December. It's cold. But she didn't have a problem walking. And her victimology tells you that too. And that's how she left that apartment. Now there's there are several obviously individuals within that apartment that obviously needed looked at. Ronnie, Donnie, David, and Steve. We're gonna leave those four, and there might be one or two that I'm missing. But again, I don't have the police reports. So it's very hard to determine with fact. And, and this is important. This is how rumors get spread. So what I try to do is back up each assertion with corroborating evidence. So somebody else saying it. If one person says it, but I can't find anything else to corroborate that, I usually don't use it. But if somebody else says, yeah, I was there, I saw the same thing. Okay, then we'll use that. You have to do that, especially Monday morning quarterbacking these cases. And that's, and that's really what you're doing. It's not fair to the investigating officers to place blame on them when you don't know what they know. And so I don't do that. Now, I will place blame on police officers when they don't contact the victim's families back, uh, are courteous to them, treat them with respect. I mean, that that's what irritates me. But them, you know, you can't go on a platform and blast police officers for an unsolved case when you have no idea what they know, what they did, and you're just going off the broad assumption the case is unsolved and police aren't doing their job. You can't do that. Now these individuals that I that I listed, they, they all, all were interviewed. And in fact, one, at least one of the victim's family members I, who I've come to admire greatly uh, her sister Jerry because she doesn't stop she just keeps digging just like a good sister would do for her sister you know that's dead she reaches out to these suspects you know tries to find out the answers you know much respect for her much respect so we have some of 
of those conversations that were passed on to me. Now, everyone suspects that's, well, I'm not going to say everyone, but it, it seems like a fair amount of people, including the family of the victim, believes that this was related to the presidential armed sexual assault. Now, depending on who you believe at that apartment, because there's many different scenarios or, or statements that they gave, one that she, Teresa, went into the bedroom with one of the guys to have consensual sex. That guy denies it. His name is David. Now, David says, you know, she wanted, she came out and said, I take that back. I don't know if David said this or one of the other people said that. But somebody in that apartment said, Teresa that came out and said, I'll have sex with all of you guys if you just let me leave. Now some of the people took that as an invitation. And it seems like something took place with not just one person. Now this David individual stated he didn't have sex with her because he couldn't get it up. Remember that, because that's going to play a key role here later on. Regardless of what happened there, because no one, there, there's no clue, no key statement for sure as to if she actually had sex with anyone, there's an allegation that she scratched one of the guys, and when confronted later, he said he was having sex with her, she had an orgasm and scratched his face. Now, much like the Greg Emmel case, which he told me he got a scratch because he had a flat tire and it went down over the bank, I knew that was bullshit and it was the victim that scratched him. This is the same bullshit story. That's not why you were scratched. In the face! If you were scratched in the back, in the arm, I would buy it. That ain't how you got a scratch. If you had a scratch. That's the thing. You don't have the police report. If they went and interviewed this guy within three days, they're still going to see that scratch. I'd want to know that. That's key. And if they bought that story, they need to assign somebody else to the case. If that story is true. Again, we don't know. Teresa's body's found. John Bur is it Burlington calls the police. Ronnie shows up at the police station shortly after this, before the body's even recovered, and is making statements allegedly at the police station about her body being found. Now people find this odd. Okay. There are people that surmise that John Burlington was actually Ronnie. And he made the call. John Burlington in the it's not they didn't have 911 then, but in the police call, he said he pulled off to urinate and he saw the body. He went home to call. Remember, they don't have cell phones back then. So he had to drive home to call. Through the years, Ronnie, who was reportedly related to a police officer, had been a suspect. Now remember, he was at the presidential arms apartment. So, you know, anybody there to me is a suspect. So, him being there certainly would raise him up as a suspect to me. Now, there were some allegations of maybe a police cover-up 
not recording his interview. He he wasn't interviewed apparently until years later. Now why this is I I don't know. I don't want to assume. But at some point in time Ronnie was picked up for a DUI. And he was brought to the station and he offered he wanted to talk to somebody about Teresa Corley murder. Now right off the bat that strikes me as odd. Kind of interjecting yourself into the case. Why? If you haven't been interviewed why are you bringing this up? Especially if you're drunk. Does that mean you have something on your chest that you want to get off? According to the police officer's email, which I read, he got, he was at home. They called him. He went right in. Yep. Tell me what you want to tell me. He said he didn't kill Teresa, but he knew he did. But he didn't want to be known as a rat. And he didn't want to didn't want to say, you know, the detective was trying to coax him to do the right thing. The chief of police came in and said, I want everything audio and video recorded. And at that time, Ronnie shut up. Didn't want to talk anymore. Now, through the years, that had been construed as police corruption. He didn't record what he was saying, therefore, you know, he was covering up for, for Ronnie. When in actuality, what he was doing was much exactly what we did in the Don Miller case, which ultimately the district attorney said the confession would be suppressed. You let him talk. You let the suspect talk. And then, after they're done with their confession, then you record it. Now, why do you do that, you ask? Well, because, number one, they're talking. You don't want to stop them. And that give them a second doubt to stop talking. You let them confess. Then you record it. So everything that that detective did, I felt, is 100% right. The guy didn't want to be known as a rat. He stopped talking. He didn't want it to be audio, video recorded. But why does he say this? Why does Ronnie say this, that he knows who did it? Is it because he truly knows, or was he trying to get out of a, a DUI? I'll give you my opinion at the end of this. Now, let's get back to my key clue. The Quaaludes and Eggs. Three different siblings remember this. Where did she get the eggs from? Well, that's going to be key. You know, remember she's dropped off at 5 a.m. in front of the police station by the second Gary Lake Farms truck driver. She's not seen again until 5.30, so there's a 30-minute gap. Approximately, we don't know for sure. What was she doing? Where was she at until she's seen again at 5.30 by the three guys carpooling to work? Now, right across the street from the police station is a restaurant called Maria's. Maria's opens up at 5 a.m. And it's frequented by a lot of truck drivers. Could she have went in there and ate breakfast? 
and that would account for the eggs in her stomach. Or did she have eggs at the Presidential Arms apartment? If those eggs are in her stomach, I would want to know that. Huge clue. Huge clue. In my original assessment of the case, I stated that I believe Teresa was murdered by a truck driver. Now, why did I say that? The eggs in her stomach, the 30 minute gap that's missing, the fact that she was found off a major interstate. When you look at the photograph in the newspaper of them pulling the body up from the gully, you see the end of a guardrail, okay? So this is the guardrail, and then there's like a little pull-off, and that's where she was found. It's the first pull-off that you can find coming out of that town so you're in that town you get up on the interstate you're driving there's guardrails the only place that you can pull off is right there it's the first place and that's where she's found to me if she was murdered by somebody at that presidential arms who said hey you know what we sexually assaulted this girl we raped this girl we cannot let her talk. We Somebody's got to go find her. They find her. If you look at an aerial of that area, there's a lot of back roads and there's a lot of woods and there's even a river to dispose of a body. For locals would know that area. In my mind, in my thinking, why the hell would you get up on an interstate, a major interstate, at 5.30, 6 o'clock in the morning, when people are starting to come to work, it's starting to get busy, to dump a body. You're out in the open. Makes no sense. But a truck driver, who would have been eating at Maria's restaurant, getting up on the interstate and heading out of town and pulls off at the very first pull off that you can to dispose of the body. To me, at that time, what, five years ago, made sense. Made the most sense. In addition to that, the ligature strangulation to me and the fact that she was found nude indicated to me at the time that the offender was more than likely a sexual sadist to have a ligature. Now remember when I said the penthouse sales where she worked and they sold that type thin rope. It was a thin line, a thin ligature strangulation. What can cause that? It's not a belt. It's not her bra. It's not clothing articles. It's a thin wire or rope or nylon strangulation. Shoelace, maybe. But if it is not premeditated by an organized defender, why, if it was somebody local, somebody from the presidential arms, what would they, it would have to be a weapon of opportunity. But like what? What's laying around that's thin, that's in your car, that you're going to use to strangle? We know that through victimology, she would get into vehicles, but she was a half a mile from her house. She had already walked a lot. She was there. Why not continue that walk? I don't I don't have an answer for that. The best I can come up for is maybe if it wasn't a truck driver, 
It was somebody that she knew and trusted from work that maybe was in that restaurant that would have given her that ride. She would have felt comfortable. It was only another half mile till she got home. And they would have had a thin ligature from that rope or from that place of employment to strangle. But I think you could deduce that whoever did this either got out of town or lived out of town. It's the only reason to get up on the interstate. If you stayed in that town, you have rivers, you have forests to dispose of a body. That is the major reason why, at the time, five years ago, my assessment focused on more than likely a truck driver. And the fact that we had what, 18 other murders of young women from New Bedford all the way to Franklin within this time frame that were murdered, missing, and some were located off of major highways. That's why I gave that assessment. Now, do I still believe in that assessment? I do. Yet, that detective that interviewed Ronnie at the police station said he was ready to confess the things. And you can't believe in coincidences, can you? That a sexual assault took place and then she's found murdered the same day? It's a tough one. I felt very confident in this assessment when I worked it for the family. And I still think that's a possibility and even maybe a probability. But so is somebody from the presidential arms being responsible for this case. Now, let's jump ahead to an update. I believe last year, Teresa's body was exhumed. Now, I'm unsure what I'm confused about, and I should have got clarification from Teresa's sister before I did this video, but I did not. I'm confused on the fact that they did find semen on Teresa's jeans. Now, I'm not sure why they had to exhume the body to find that. Which I doubt she was buried in those jeans. But regardless, they got a match. And the match for the semen on the jeans was to David. Remember David, who went into the bedroom with Teresa, who said, I couldn't get it up. Couldn't get it up. How'd your semen end up on her pants? So he's lying. Is he responsible for the murder? The district attorney's office will tell you that's a big leap. Could have been consensual sex back there that ha that took place. And they're right. You just don't know. You just don't know. But he lied. Much like Jay lied to me in the Gail Matthews murder. Didn't have didn't have sex with her. Didn't have sex. Can't can't explain how his semen ended up in her in a large quantity. And then when confronted twenty years later, he says to me, Okay. You got me. I did do it. Well, that doesn't mean he murdered her. Just that he was lying. The same thing with David. <sighs> Teresa's sister still pushes very hard for this case. As she should. I do not know what the police know. I would want to read the statements from all those guys at Presidential Arms Department. And what they observed. I'm dying to know. The truth is in there. It's hard to make the truth through assessments when you don't have everything. But 
you could deduce a lot, which I have done, and I think it helps. It doesn't hurt. Because what if the police believe it's related to the presidential arms apartment? That's very good assumption. But then they get my report and they say, well, we never considered the eggs in the Quaalude, her eating at this restaurant, which was right across the street from where she was dumped. You know, consider this. You think now most police officers or police stations are open 24-7. But some aren't. Some, are, you have to, they're on call. The small, I don't know what about this police station. Maybe it wasn't open at 5 in the morning. And you say, well, that sounds strange. That's not strange. There's some small towns where you have to call a number to get police service. Why didn't she go in there? Maybe it wasn't open and she decided, hey, it doesn't open until 6. I'm going over here to eat some eggs, eat breakfast. The police officers should check that restaurant out. Now, maybe they did. I'm sure they did. And then we just don't know. But no one's talking about the quaaludes either. If she had quaaludes in her system, she wasn't a drug user. She experimented with marijuana, which everybody did back in the 70s. Did she take quaaludes voluntarily? I doubt it. Which means somebody had to give them to her, maybe the date raper. Could she have gotten those at the truck stop? Or the Maria's restaurant? Yeah, but that'd be a lot more difficult. It'd be easier to do it at the presidential arms. you got to imagine five, six guys at this apartment drinking, already drunk. She's drunk. One girl. One girl. You think she didn't feel uncomfortable there? And if she did come out and say, I'll have sex with all of you guys if you just let me leave. What's that tell you? She's being held against her will. One way or another. Such a, a difficult case when you don't know everything. When you, when you don't know what happened inside that apartment. There's a couple guys there that, that certainly do. Now, I believe Ronnie has since died. Took whatever he knew to the grave. But there's people that do know. They certainly know. They know whether she was raped or not. Or whether it was consensual. That's a start. Because there's two different versions. There's some people, you know, that were in that apartment that said yes. She was raped. And you have other people saying, no, she, it was consensual. Who do believe? Is it possible that it was consensual? Yes. Probable? I don't think so. There was also indications from at least one of the people that were in that apartment that somebody did go looking for her that night after she left. Did they find her? Maybe. I know one of the guys there, his name was Steve, and I believe he's the one that had the scratch on his face. I know how you get to his house, though. You get up on 495 and you go out of town because he didn't live in town. Again, I go back to why dump a body off of the interstate? Why? The only reason I can think of is because you're heading out of town. No other reason that I can think of. To me, that would take away a couple of those people at the presidential arms apartment. So then you can deduce, hey, it's somebody that lives out of town. Was there anybody in that apartment that lived out of town in that direction? Northbound, 495. If the answer is yes, you better put a big circle around that guy's name and look into him 
a little bit further. If not, I go back to my original assessment. Look at a truck driver who was eating at Maria's. But 5.30 in the morning, getting daylight, well, it's an odd time for a serial killer to strike. And again, I'm not... Serial killers are not the majority, not even close. People have a perception that if it's an unsolved case, they want to point at serial killers. And they'll say, well, Israel Keys was active during that time frame. Then there, Ted Bundy has thought, you know, relatives that live in that location. Well, that doesn't matter. The majority, I'm saying 90%, even probably more than 90%. Of murders are not done by serial killers. Yes, it's possible. But it's not always probable. However, in this case, when you have 19 other murders of young people in that area, you have to consider it. You have to. So what do I think? I think it's one of the two. You know. I I always say listen to the family. Listen to the friends. They know the area more than an outsider looking in. They live there. They know the reputations of the people involved. You have to consider that. You take that in. I didn't always believe that. I wanted to be as neutrally unbiased as possible and didn't want to hear anything until after I'd done my assessment, which is good. And I felt strong about this assessment five years ago, and I still feel it's, it's probable. But it's just as probable as those people with the presidential arms having something to do with this. 5.30, 6 o'clock in the morning, odd time for a serial killer to strike. But it happens. It's an odd time for anybody to strike. You know, an opportunistic killer, seeing her walking down the street, is she, is she hitchhiking? I don't think. She's already there. She's so close to home. Would she, would she actually hitchhike that extra half a mile? I don't think so. She would just go. But she would get a ride from somebody that she knew. Would somebody she knows from the presidential arms, would she get back into a vehicle with them if they came by? I don't know the answer to that. She could. If she was cold, maybe she wasn't scared. Even though she may have been sexually assaulted. I just don't know. That's the damnedest misery of it all. Is the million questions. That only Teresa and the killer knows. I'm going to end that. On that note. It's been a tough week for me to go back through Teresa Corley. Because it. It. I have it in here for this family, like I do all families, but this one's tough. A lot of questions, a lot of unanswered questions that I certainly would know, like to know the answers to. But, you know, if you have any information, if you're watching this, this channel has grown by leaps and bounds. My one video has well over half a million views and... If you're watching this and you have information, please contact uh, the Massachusetts State Police. And I'm going to give the number. 781-830-4990. And that's to the Norfolk, Norfolk District Attorney's Office tip line. Call and give your information. You know, it's been since 1978. This family deserves answers. Teresa she deserves justice and that's that's all we can ask for so thoughts and prayers as always 
always to the victim and the victim's families. And let's get some closure to this case. Just tears me apart. This is it. Teresa Corley. Uh, deep dive. Remember, Thursday, tomorrow, we're going to do a live chat about this case. So I can hear some more input. Listen, I don't know everything. I'll be the first to admit that. You know, I'm not always right. And some people have different theories. And I, I'm willing to listen to that. You know, I think every good detective should be willing to listen. We're going to do that Thursday. Friday, I'm going to answer your questions and comments on the video like I do every Friday. So let's finish this week out strong. Let's get some answers for the Corley family. And uh, let's get some justice for Teresa Corley. With that, Maine's out. Thank you.